Okay, we're good to go. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, PGT Media is an entertainment industry broadcast. We're interviewing the creative minds from the comic, film, music, and game publishing industry. And I'm your guest host for today. My name is Dark from Lankovic. And without further ado, welcome to episode 356 of Two Geeks Talking. With me today is Scott Lincoln, the creative mind behind the online webcomic Route to Destroyer. And now that we've won, finally won against the hurdles of technology, how are you today, Scott? <laughs> I'm doing well, and you? That couldn't be better. I'm very happy that this Google Hangout is finally working, and we don't have to go through what we did yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> well, technology always offers a few things for us to overcome, just to keep us strong, I believe. So. <laughs> Well, I suppose so. I mean, without getting into what happened yesterday, I'll just say Google Hangouts had a few issues and it kind of complicated our lives. But uh, now that we're finally here, uh, could you tell us a bit of, a little about yourself and about your comic in particular? Sure. Um, well, uh, I mean, I've been cartooning for a long time. I initially started uh, cartooning probably in grade school, you know, as a lot of people do. You read comics. Um, I seem to always be reading. There's a uh, uh, consumed a lot of my pastime, whether it was uh, comics or anything else. I seemed to read a lot of books when I was younger, and um, a lot of information kind of filtered into my head, and I took in a lot for a long time, and I guess nowadays I'm looking for ways to express what I took in for all those years. Um, I started as a professional when I was 15 years old. I got into a local newspaper in town, and um, I got the going rate, which was pretty cool. And I did that for about um, two or three years. And um, unfortunately, like many newspapers, they, uh, they closed down after a little while because the town was kind of shrinking. And you know, it had more to do with the economy of the town than, I think, the state of newspapers at the time. Were you kind of doing uh, political papers, like satirical? or? No, no. I was just doing a, a kind of a pet strip, actually. Um, you know, kind of like Garfield, only I was doing it with a, a Siberian Husky. Which is what I had for a pet. So, oh. <laughs> uh, the name of that strip was called Kabluna. Kabluna. So, so you might, if you see Kabluna around, sometimes that's just uh, my publishing name or something I use for like when I print my books and things like that. On this one, Kabluna Comics. So. And how did you bring life to Ralph the Destroyer then? Well, um, Ralph started in uh, the fall of 2004, actually. Um, I had uh, become uh, an assistant on the uh, comic strip Nancy. I don't know if you're familiar with Nancy. It's the old leg the legacy strip by Ernie Bushmiller. Not um, entirely, but... It was uh, started in, the, I believe, in the 20s is when he started it. And it, it got passed down to two or three artists since he uh, retired it, or retired himself. But it belonged to Universal Fe uh, United Features for a long time, so they, they kept artists coming in and producing it because they own the copyrights on it. But I, I worked for the artist who was at the time doing it, I believe he still is, uh, Guy Gilchrist. And um, I assisted with him basically, you know, drawing backgrounds and coloring the Sundays and working some of the other projects. And he decided he was going to start a, a school in the area. So I started teaching cartooning to, you know, other people, uh, kids, adults, whoever was interested. and. Um, one of the lessons we would do is uh, draw the alien. It was uh, we chose that because it was like this really simple kind of gray-looking alien. You know, no, nothing fancy. It was just an egg-shaped head and a little bean-shaped body. You know, and he always used to draw his aliens naked, and uh, that kind of <laughs> bugged me. So, <laughs> you know, I was a little, feel a little uh, uncomfortable with that situation. So. <laughs> but what happened is um, one night we were drawing the alien, and I realized, you know, it's like didn't matter whether the students were like 8 or 80 and we did literally have like an 80 year old student and, and an 8 year old student mm -hmm. and um, it's like whenever we started drawing aliens everybody kind of like perked up and it just kind of reminded me you know it's like you know in movies aliens are everywhere you know in comic books aliens everywhere you know even TV nowadays you know it's, it's like it went from the X-Files to now we got all kinds of sci-fi going on on television I'm like you know there are no comic strips in the newspaper that have an alien I mean starring you might see him as little walk-ons or on a panel like to do a one one-off gag or something like that but there's no like starring the alien 
So I went to my uh, boss and I said, you know, has anybody tried to do a strip with an alien as the lead character? And he said, uh, oh yeah, but it never works out. And I said, why is that? Because it's impossible. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> it's impossible. It's like, no, no, there's, why is, so my mind works this way. I said, why is it impossible? And he went, uh, well, because aliens are scary, because nobody can identify with aliens, because they're so intelligent and, you know, they never do anything wrong. And, you know, he went down this whole list. So I wrote the list down and I said, okay, aliens are scary. Cross that out. Alien is really cute. Alien is not identifiable. Alien will be every man. You know, so I just went down this list of how can I flip it on its ear and create something that is the opposite of what people expect the alien to be in a comic strip. Yeah, Ralph was de- is definitely certainly unique. He kind of has a, I don't know if you're like from the Looney Tunes, the Mar- Marvin to the, the Martian, who will follow with Bugs Bunny a lot, but uh, rather than being an antagonist, we have a, uh, Ralph here, who is so curious about uh, the new world, uh, about the world he's exploring, and he's he's got so such unique perceptions. I remember uh, at the very begin beginning of the comic, he he lands and he sees all these articles about women and comes to the conclusion, oh, women must have ruled this world. <laughs> rule this world. <laughs> that's that's what I like about you know sure. his character has kind of a, an innocence. But it's a logical innocence. I mean, if you really look at it, why wouldn't you draw that conclusion? <laughs> These are the most popular people in the world. They must run everything. <laughs> Maybe they do. <laughs> yeah, and his interactions with other characters are just amazing. Like, for example, uh, Ralph and Lexi, they just bounce off each other so well. <laughs> yeah, that was um, actually, I, I discovered that um, I, was, uh, I was going to church with my family, and there was this little girl who actually Lexi is kind of based off of and um, she was a little older than my son he was only like uh, four three or four or something like that. he's a little guy and um, she was always trying to corral him and and he was just like la, 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 just going wherever he went and she would constantly you know try to don't go this way you know she's always trying to like get him to do what she wants but she didn't want to like force him, you know, because somehow she, that, that wasn't right, but she couldn't quite keep him corralled in because he'd just like wander and he would go, so she'd have to like run around him and she was constantly like in his orbit, like she couldn't resist him, but she couldn't ignore him either, <laughs> and that kind of set to me the kind of relationship that Lexi and Ralph have, you know, she can't ignore him because her planet, her planet is in jeopardy, but she can't really control him either <laughs> because he's capable of destroying the planet, <laughs> which is different too from other alien stories because a lot of times um, those particular characters are um, they trip up, you know, like certain. I, there's probably uh, in. Um, alien characters you can think of where you know oh they're going to destroy the world but they end up being too much of a klutz Mm -hmm. it's it's not the same thing with Ralph Ralph all he has to do is go up there push the button start the sequence boom take it out that's it nobody can stop him I mean it's a continent sized ship that eradicates whole armadas (laughs) there's nothing that can stop him except his conscience you know and that's a lot different than what most people are writing about and I think that's what gives it more life and more more heart you know is what it is basically what would you say Lexi is to Ralph is she kind of helping his conscience well yeah there's a little bit of her being a conscience I mean I I generally steer away from like one-dimensional characters because I like I like a little bit more meat on the bones you know that people are people are complex. Let's be honest. You know, yeah. certain people are not. Um, Ray is not complex. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> um, you know, there there are characters who are not complex, but they tend mm-hmm. to be more focused on certain goals. She, Lexi tends to be more like, um, I mean, she is his conscience, but at the same time, he's also she's also his. She's the opposition, more or less. I mean, she's one of the few that knows 
that he's an alien and what he's up to. Most people just kind of ignore him or just accept him as some kid or doing whatever he's doing, you know, which is, is something that, you know, is kind of a running gag through the strip, basically. Yeah, it is kind of funny how everybody just assumes he's just a kid, even though, I mean, he, he's clearly he looks, not. yeah, he's, he <laughs> clearly looks different. Right? And that's, that's what I like about it. I, I yeah. think back, too, of, um, you know, like the, the old peanut strips where you have Snoopy, like, flying around like a helicopter, you know, or... You know, sitting you know sitting on his treehouse like a vulture. Does anybody notice what he's doing? You know, I mean, <laughs> this is completely fantastic. You know that he's you know sitting on his doghouse, flying it like a sap with camel. You know, it's just like does does anybody notice that he's different? You know, and that always kind of struck me in the back of my head, and I always thought that that was kind of a cool idea that you have this fantastic thing among the mundane. You know, and then people don't notice it because their lives just keep going. You know, it's like nothing has actually interrupted their life to the point where they would actually have to wake up and see something different. You know, this this fulfills their needs, or this is an inconvenience, but we'll work around it. You know, this is <laughs> that kind of thing. Well, yeah, the, the many characters that he, yeah, Lexi is pretty much the only one that notices the difference. But Ralph does interact with a lot of other characters, and I guess. In a sense, they, they all really bounce off each other greatly. I remember, I remember remembering uh, Thane, the homeless guy in New York from the very beginning, and they kind of <laughs> had, he had the big sign about aliens are coming to destroy Earth, and Ralph is all, well, you seem to be the only one that knows what's going on. <laughs> but in, in that sense, kind of like, which character are you finding the most uh, fun to write in terms of interacting with Ralph? Well, Lexi, definitely because they're such polar opposites. He's kind of like, you know, just... <laughs> let things roll and kind of see what happens and um, constantly putting off where Lexi is more type A, you know, she's got to like have everything in order, everything's got to be just right, you know, I got to do something, you know, here she is, she's digging a bomb shelter because she can't stop them from blowing up the, the planet, <laughs> you know, she's got to do something, something needs to be done, you know, even if I can't stop it, I got to be prepared in some way, you know, even if it seems silly, I got to do something, you know, and, and that's why it's a lot of fun to play off of her. Now there's other characters, and, and my, my methodology is is I believe that introducing a character into the story, um, one, I try to do it slowly. I don't just like, hey, here's a new character. I usually put them in the background somewhere leading up to it, so you know that they're there. Because that's how it is in real life. You don't just like meet somebody, hey, let's be best friends. <laughs> <laughs> Usually it's like friend of a friend, or you see somebody at a party or a gathering, and it's like, oh, I know that person, and then you meet him again, it's like, oh, yeah, I remember you from that, and then slowly it kind of builds up, and if you see even with Lexi, she's standing in line at the Comic-Con, they walk by each other in the crowd, and then they kind of bump into each other, you know, there's a, a gradual kind of introduction in that respect. So usually you have your kind of characters, they, they start off in the background and then you slowly bring them forward. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's more realistic in uh, how relationships are formed. So I try to express that in the story. Um, also, I try not to introduce characters that are going to overlap too much. You know, I'm not going to have like another type A person that's going to find out that Ralph's going to destroy the world and is like trying to control him. That's Lexi's thing, so keep that focused on her. Um, Lexi's got her own issues. She's got her own nemesis. You know, she's got, uh, you know, she's got her own allies and people who care about her, and um, those people have to have their own vision or their own aspect of being that's different than her. Mm -hmm. um, Kaiser's whole thing, uh, the guy who runs the, the tow garage or the junkyard, um, he's, he's an older gentleman, you know, he, he's lived life, he's seen a lot, he's done a lot, he's fought the man, he's lost, he's won, you know, and his whole thing is kids today are just like completely wasting their life, you know, you need to buck up and be a man and try and get it, you know, <laughs> try and get it together, kid, you know, and that's his whole thing, he wants to... He sees Ralph as this wayward kid with no direction, and he's going to make a man out of him. You know, Ralph doesn't want to be a man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, being a man hurts, from what I can tell. <laughs> yes, it does. Yes, it does. Um, there are a lot of I use a lot of actual uh, 
true life experiences to uh, oh, <laughs> Ray right. Kaiser because <laughs> I knew a lot of those guys. I knew a lot of those guys growing up, and um, I was always small for my age, and you know, I just I just looked like I needed help apparently. <laughs> oh my! Yeah, there are more than a few occasions, you know, somebody was trying to put hair on my chest, I guess, but. <laughs> And it always ends up hurting in some way. You know? <laughs> but, uh, you know, so that's his thing. And, you know, then, of course, he's got Brian, who's kind of like his cheerleader. He's just an adrenaline junkie, you know, and he's just everybody's pal, really excitable fellow. And I've introduced um, Aaron, who's the waitress at the donut hole, um, which is kind of where everybody kind of congregates after a while. You know, everybody kind of stops for, you know, coffee and donuts, right? Everybody just pretty much... <laughs> The universal needs of all human beings, basically. And um, in the story, you know, she's got her place that's a little bit different. She's, in some ways, Aaron kind of parallels Ralph, mm -hmm. if you read it. Um, you know, she's kind of got an innocent kind of look about things, and she's kind of caught off guard very often. And she's got responsibilities that she has to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis that are unusual, so... It kind of gives them both something, you know, in some ways they're kind of like moving in the same direction in that respect. Um, and she's other kind of a, oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. I was just kind of like... Yeah, I was kind of thinking on, on Aaron. I mean, she's kind of a, a young adult. I think she just yeah. uh, turned 18. So she's kind of experiencing the world, the world finally through, through the eyes of an adult. Right. And Ralph is, well, I'll just say, finally experiencing the world. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so they so kind of have that, they're moving together in that sense. So that, that's an interesting comparison because you have this person, this is a person and here's Ralph. And they're both seeing with a similar vision, but they may be seeing it from different sides in that respect. So. Yeah. That is very interesting. I hadn't thought about that until you just brought it up. But that's, uh, it, yeah, it's, it's actually very something that I'm, I'm shocked kind of I overlooked. But that's... <laughs> but, <laughs> Now, uh, earlier you mentioned that uh, you don't really foresee anybody really figuring out that Ralph is an alien and wants to destroy the world. Well, let's kind of uh, spin it a bit. This is something I am very curious about. Okay. Is Ralph ever going to find out that he is Lexi's boyfriend? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. he'll get. I'm, I'm sure he'll get confronted by it. Just, just because Beth, um, Lexi's classmate and Aaron's little sister, um, is always dying for an opportunity to torment Lexi for some reason, uh, which... Uh, at one point, I will answer that question: Why does she, you know why she has it in for Lexi so much, or why she's constantly in her orbit? <laughs> but um, and that's a great that's a great dynamic too because I noticed for a while some people were starting to say, um, some people felt like Lexi wasn't empathetic enough until I introduced Beth, and then people couldn't stand Beth, <laughs> and they loved Lexi. <laughs> So it's all relative, I guess, you know. Mm -hmm. It's like it, once somebody else is picking on somebody, then it's just like, oh, wait a minute, that's not fair. You know? Oh, yeah, not at all. <laughs> I, I, I was surprised. I mean, I wrote like three strips in the, in the emotional response I was getting from people. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, um, comments on it was, you know, that um, why is it that I hate this little girl so much? It borders on irrational. <laughs> And uh, Beth just has this, Beth, I'm not going to say there's anything specific like she's been diagnosed with. I know people like have said like ADD. You know, no, it's nothing like that. She's just, I like to say, I don't know if it's around here, but we kind of say, you know, like when somebody's a certain way that you don't really, they're not marching to everybody else's drummer, you just kind of say, you know, well, Beth is Beth, you know. <laughs> and um, And that just means she's not... She, you know, she's okay, she's she's functional, but she's just kind of going in her own direction with things. And it doesn't matter how you try to push her off, she's just going where she wants to go. Mm -hmm. It may not make sense now, but it seems to make sense to her, you know. And yeah. uh, <laughs> yeah. she, She's a brat, but in a good way. <laughs> yeah, she's not, she's not like trying to beat anybody up, and she's not like throwing a fit or anything like that. But she does poke at people, whether intentionally or not, she, she is definitely uh, an That's agitator. Buttons, huh? 
<laughs> and I think we all know somebody like that. You know? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Now, here's, a, here's another character that I'm kind of curious about. We haven't seen much of Thane since his introduction. Yeah. What's, uh, what's he up to? Will we see him again? Oh, yeah. Well, we'll see him again. Um, in fact, you may not have realized it, but you did see him again in a Sunday. Sunday. Uh, the last time I remember him was he was in his garbage can, and I guess the Galactic Council was coming to see him or speak to him. Or something. Yeah, yeah. He was. Uh, Ralph was kind of recounting the story yeah. of Galactic Council, uh. <laughs> and it, then he gives him directions because he remembers he sees the library card mm -hmm. that Lexi had in her purse. Yes, and it's right near the town that he used to live in. So that's mm -hmm. he gives directions to Ralph, and Ralph goes, and of course he gets lost. But <laughs> yeah, that's a whole other can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, that's not actually the last time we see Thane. Thane actually appears later on when um, in a, in a flashback actually. Ah. And now you're gonna have to go back and check and see what. It I will is. have to go back and check. <laughs> I kind of went through the the comic throughout the, throughout the weekend, starting for Friday, and I kind of finished it up uh, on Sunday. So, and I'm a, I'd like to I'm glad to say I'm all caught up, but now I want more. So. <laughs> well, that's good. That's that's the hope of good writing, you know. Um, it is. Which, which was a funny thing for me, you know. It's like for so many years I worked on you know trying to create good art and working really hard on the art, and then one day I realized it's like, gee, do I know how to write well enough for this? <laughs> yeah. So I sat down with all these books, you know, how to write comedy and stand up and all these different things and personality profiles and psychology and I just started reading through all this stuff to figure out how to better capture, you know, uh, what, what people would respond to. Because um, I know what I respond to when I'm watching a movie mm -hmm. or even a TV show. Um, I respond to good character development myself. Yeah. Um, the story can kind of do this kind of stuff. But if the characters are intriguing, you'll go with them, you know. Uh, my wife is a big fan of Lost. And um, that's a case where, you know, there are all kinds of people love it, hate it, you know, whatever. But it had good characters. And you kind of wanted to see what happened to the characters. And that's why I watched it with her, because I was like, let's go on the ride. Let's see where it takes us and see what happens. I think this character is interesting, you know. <laughs> Still to this day, we have this polar opposite reaction to uh, one of the characters in that show. <laughs> oh boy! Uh, would you say all those, I guess, the psychology books, uh, did they help you with improving this, or kind of were? I I felt that they did. I like mm -hmm. to be prepared. I like to um, I like to come. You know, I like to really have a good grasp of something before I really wade into it. Sometimes I'll just kind of like, hey, what the hey, and jump in. But in this case. I felt like if I'm going to properly express myself through this, I need to have kind of a skeleton underneath the surface that's real, you know, because I've seen too many times when people write, excuse me, for for instance, like, oh, we need to have a female character, so she'll be a really cool gamer, and she's going to, like, really m kick it up with the guys, and it's like, Mm -hmm. hmm, where have I seen that before? Oh, only on a thousand different things. <laughs> you know what the problem is? I don't know that chick. <laughs> yeah. I don't know her. So, you know, who is it really? You know, what what is the real response? I mean, go out into the world and see who people really are and how do they really respond under these circumstances. Um, and that's what I wanted to figure out. I read, uh, I'm trying to remember, I think it's uh, Myers-Briggs... Um, personality profile, basically how people delineate information and they break it down into these different ways. You know, you're introvert, extrovert, do you perceive, do you comprehend, you know, different different things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And um, feeling versus perceiving or, you know, there's different ways that we process information and it affects how we react and interact with each other. And um, it doesn't make it good or evil or anything like that, but it makes us different people. <laughs> so yeah. I basically go went down the list and I said, okay, this character belongs to this. You know, this is an INTJ or an ISTP, mm -hmm. which is just you know um, a short shorthand for whatever personality that they are, and uh, that kind of gives me at least uh, a touchstone, more or less, 
for that character. I know they're not going to behave in a certain way that's contrary to that, unless it's you know some kind of uh, personal breakthrough or for it has to be a you know really out of the left field kind of gag that mm -hmm. makes sense in that. But to always have that touchstone to go back to gives them a sense of being real. And um, sometimes you don't you don't always see that in comic characters very much. You know they they tend to be like I hate to say it because I, I love peanuts, but you have like Pigpen. What's the whole deal with Pigpen? He's mess. <laughs> Do we know anything about Pigpen? What his personality is? What he like? Not too much. You know, he he just kind of like walks around with a cloud of dirt, and you know all the jokes are based on that cloud of dirt getting on things, and you know people not being able to see through the cloud. And, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I find humor in, in the way that we deal with each other. You know, we, we, there's, I think people grow more attached to something when they are personally or emotionally invested in it. And if you can't create an emotional response, then you're not, you're not really bringing the audience with you. you know? At least that's how I feel. Anyways. Yeah, it's, it's definitely true. They have to be relatable. They can't afford to have a, especially in comics, like your character to be like a caricature of something. It doesn't. It, oh, if you want to relate. Yeah. So I, I had to find a way to define my stuff yeah. to be different. You know, so so um, because I know what happens too with a lot of people. If you're a, a comic book artist, right? What do you do? You read comic books, right? There's no shame in that. That's what you do. You read comic yeah. books. You learn all about comic, comic art, uh, book art, and that's how you draw. If you're a storyboard artist, what do you do? You study storyboards, and you, you go through that, and you create that, and then your, your work looks like a storyboard artist. When I created comic strips, I said, I want to do something a little different, because nobody who ever gets anywhere creates something that looks like somebody else, Right? I mean, the reason that why we like different comic strips, whether it's like uh, Bloom County, eventually he started out looking a lot like Gary Trudeau, but very quickly defined himself as being his own thing. He transitioned very quickly, and that's what got him to launch off. Garfield was different. Um, Calvin and Hobbes, very different than everything else going on. Peanuts was different, in fact, but... What Peanuts ended up doing was setting a trend for minimalism that a lot of other people followed. And, um, you know, but people always want the one that's original. They don't want the, you know, the knockoff. Like, you ever go into Walmart or, you know, a big, a big store and you'll see, like, um, you know, a, a Disney movie out, right? And it'll be like, uh, I don't know, uh, Beauty and the Beast or A Little Mermaid or something like that. And, like, just around the corner on one of the kiosks will be, like, all the Chinese knockoffs, you know, the mermaid that was little, you know, <laughs> and they're yep. just all these like horribly drunk, like just bang that sucker out, see if we can get people to buy it for five bucks, you know, and, and I don't want my strip to be the knockoff, I want to be the original, and I want to be the one that everybody else copies and said, oh man, I wish I'd, I'd been, you know, figured that out, or, you know, been the guy to do that, and, uh, you know, I, I still hope for that uh, one of these days, um, I mean, my goal always was actually to be in newspapers with this strip. Um, I know there's going to be some interference to that, but I am actually, I have been making headway. Um, it's been a lot of years, but I am making headway. <laughs> it's been a very uh, arduous journey, as it were. But I am actually closer now than I ever have been. Um, I mean, I've been inside the, uh, inside the buildings of... Uh, a number of syndicates actually talking to uh, the head editors with it. I mean, I've spoken on the phone with Brendan Burford, who was the head of King. Um, I've spoken, you know, I was inside um, United Features talking with them about syndication. Um, I've spoken with Amy Lago of Washington Writers Group, um, Washington Post Writers Group, and uh, you know, everybody loves it. But it's just tough right now because everybody's afraid to try something a little new. Because newspapers, everybody perceives that newspapers are going to, like, all of a sudden they're just going to dry up and disappear. I don't believe that's the case, personally. I think it's like a good book. Every, people want to sit down with something tactile and read it. 
Um, I also believe that in spite of the internet taking over a lot of news and whatnot, it doesn't replace a newspaper because newspapers have reporters. <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny you mentioned that because I'm actually in school going for journalism. So if, yeah. if newspapers die out, then I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> No, I believe. You know, I believe. I just think, unfortunately, yeah. newspapers aren't capitalizing. They're not advertising that fact. They're not saying like, "Hey, sure, you can go on the web and get some gossip and some hearsay, but come read a newspaper and get the facts." We have people yeah. on the ground reporting. We have eyewitnesses. We have this information. So and so will stake his reputation on this. You know, that's what made newspapers great. You know, for news. The other part that made them great, of course, was the comic section. But <laughs> <laughs> definitely. <laughs> But I think newspapers are doing themselves a, a disservice by not emphasizing that aspect and pursuing it dil diligently. You know, I think I think it's just because people kind of forget. You know, we kind of get caught up in trying to compete with this new technology that's out there, and it's like, don't even compete with them. It's not the same thing. Trust me. You know, um, something you found on you know a Twitter, you know, <laughs> or somebody's V blog isn't the same as reading a newspaper where they had photographers and journalists go down to the scene and see what was going on. You know, it's a big difference. You know, one is secondhand hearsay, the other one is first eyewitness. You know, and that makes a big difference. Yeah, to me. It definitely does. So. Do you, do you, is there a big difference to you in terms of comics that appear in newspapers and uh, self-published web comics? Like in your case? Well, I can see um, Yes and no. You know, I'm not going to say one is necessarily better than the other or anything like that because it is simply not true. There are some fantastic artists on the web. There are some absolutely horrible artists on the web. There are some fantastic artists who are professionals. There are some guys that, you know, they're just hacking it out in an afternoon. You know, you just know it. You know, you can feel it. Now, the ones who hack it out on the web, they get where they are because they're funny. The guys who do it in the newspapers hack it out, they get where they are because they're funny. You know, it's so there's all kinds of balance. There's really it's just a harder club to join to get into a newspaper. I mean, there's probably in the world less than three hundred professionally syndicated newspaper artists. I mean, it's a small group. It would be easier to become a professional baseball player. Oh wow than to be a, a syndicated cartoonist. So guess what I chose to do? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can guess it wasn't baseball, but... <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, but you did say you were uh, closer now to getting Ralph uh, syndicated. Yes, so. I, like I said, I've been to all, I've been to, or at least spoken to almost, every, you know, some, to somebody in almost every major syndicate, and now there's only a few of them now, so it's pretty much all of them. So do you foresee uh, LeBrow being syndicated sometime in the near future? Or? Yes. In fact, um, I'm working. I'm working on something right now that actually should um, get Ralph in front of newspaper editors directly. Um, it's a lot of work, and it's been taking a bit of time. But I am hopeful that once Ralph kind of gets a foothold in newspapers and people see what is out there. I think that they'll lock on to it because, you know, all I hear is, you know, well, Calvin and Hobbes is the last great strip that we'll ever see. You know, nobody's ever going to do anything like that again. Now, I'm not saying I'm as good as Bill Watterson. I'm not saying that. But I believe we should try something a little different. Maybe people will decide that it is, you know, in its own right, a great strip. You know, I don't want people to, I'd hate to go through life thinking that I could try to do something different and interesting and something that people could be excited about and I didn't try as hard as I could to make it happen. And um, I mean, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in excellence, just, just doing the very best that you can because something inside of you compels you to do it, you know, not because you have to or somebody's trying to make you or even necessarily because you'll get rich doing it, you know. Um, though that would be awesome. <laughs> but um, I do it because this is what I would be happy with. I would want to read this strip. In fact, you know, 
one of the things I, I tweeted that once. I said, you know, does it? Uh, aren't you? Are, you know, when, if people always say, uh, write and draw the comic that you'd like to read. But when you do, don't you, do you end up feeling like kind of a narcissist? You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, it's it's kind of funny. It's the, it's the same way because I took some uh, writing classes just to give a bit about my experience, and they also said the same thing: write what you would want to read. Right. And uh, I did end up doing that, and I read my own work for a little bit until I got tired of it. But <laughs> do you, <laughs> but, like, do you well, go back and read it, Ralph? You feel excited about it. You're like, yeah, I'm doing something good here. This this is what I'd want to. Re Who is this guy? This guy is doing good work. You know, hey, wait a minute, it's me. <laughs> then there's other days where you completely feel like a total failure. It's like, oh, I slapped that together. That was awful. I hate the composition of this. What was yeah. I thinking? <laughs> I'm an idiot. This guy over here is like way better than me. I didn't even try. <laughs> Yeah, from from a content creator, I can definitely relate to that. Yeah, do you go, do you often go back and kind of reread your own strips? Well, yeah, if for yeah. no other reason than I'm trying to get a feel for the the continuity that I'm creating. Um, yeah. I I do enjoy it because this is the comic that I would want to read. Yeah. But it's also too to kind of like try and get a consistency of the the flow. Um, the way that I'm writing, I'm actually writing this as a daily strip. But I'm only unfortunately able to get it out. For a while, I was doing it at three times a week. Lately, I've been doing it once a week, just because I gotta pay the bills with other jobs and things like that, which I'd like to get rid of <laughs> and just do this. Part of my big yeah. push to get Ralph in newspapers um, is hopefully that it would start paying for itself. Um, okay. I've considered other things like Patreon and. Um, possibly, you know, a Kickstarter or something like that, but I have to figure out how to operate my newsletter, apparently, in order to make that effective. So <laughs> I've been told mailing lists are very important, and it's like, oh, yeah, I should, get, should go and figure that part of it out, I guess. <laughs> but oh, oh, everybody in webcomics tells me that. It's like, you got to get your mailing list. Gotta, that's like your most crucial thing. I'm like, okay, and drawing isn't important. <laughs> it's like, that's what I focus on. You know, it, ta it takes me a while to draw them, to be honest. I, I take several hours, actually, on each one. So, How many strips do you usually have in advance at a posting? Well, sometimes, to be honest, I'm really kind of busting the, busting the, the uh, line with it. Um, for a while, I was keeping like a week or two ahead, you know. But unfortunately, like I said, what, what happens for me as of late is because I've had to like take other freelance jobs or, you know, work third shift. <laughs> um, it kind of like cuts into your schedule and things kind of get eaten up after a while. Um, but I do try to, you know, keep something going. I try not to take any really long hiatuses or anything like that. Um, but I know the strip, if I can get back to doing it three times a week, I know I see more traffic than if it's going once a week. So I... I always want to produce more if I could. If it gets into newspapers, well, then you'll see it updating on the web uh, seven days a week, you know, because that'll be the same schedule as in, as it would be in the newspapers. But you know, that's something I'm working up to. I'm trying trying to get there. <laughs> it's always a struggle to get there. Um, not that I can't, because I had already when I came up with the concept and I started writing. One of the first things I did was sat down and I said, "Okay, how many can I do a day?" and how much art can I put into it and how much writing, how much time do I have to spend writing to create basically a week's worth of strips and that's what I, I created the strip so that I could do the most that I could creating two strips a day, or two to three, if I really push it, three, um, and a Sunday which takes two days to do basically for me to, to draw up ink and color. Um, so basically, if I were doing this full time, it would be a full time job. This is not something I would hang out in an afternoon. I would be working forty hours, seven days a week at least on this. But it would be the thing that I want to do most of all. You know, so it's not a burdensome thing to do in that respect. Um, but at least I'd have my weekends. So. <laughs> yeah, if it's. If it's fun and, and enjoy doing it, why not? Like I would like to have a job that I loved as well. <laughs> I, th I think it's the goal yeah. most people would like. Yeah. Uh, I think the only problem is some people don't know what they want to do. I know I didn't for a long time. You know, I 
like I said, when I was in grade school, I started drawing. When I was 15, I got a newspaper. This is great. This is cool. You know, I got the re rate for one newspaper, <laughs> which wasn't a lot of money, but it's just like, cool. And then after that was over, it's like, yeah, I don't know what to do now. I guess I have to get a job. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you start mowing lawns and working at McDonald's and all this other stuff, and you're like, this really doesn't seem to cut it for me. I, my, my brain wants to do more, and you know, it's got to be something out there that I want to do. And, you know, with... With this, I just kept doodling and drawing. I mean, it wasn't the artwork that it is now. That happened over a course of decades, really. Um, and a big chunk of it came from working with Guy um, because he's the one who taught me how to use a brush to ink and to use, you know, traditional uh, forms of uh, comic production as opposed to, you know... When I met him, you know, I was just using, like, mechanical pencils and markers, you know, and... I always looked at the marker lines and went, I like the pencils better. The pencils just look better than the marker. I don't know why that is. It just looks awful. And he says, because you're, there's no life in the line. You need to create something that has more life in it. And you can only do that with like a dip brush or a, uh, or a dip pen. And I'm like, well, I tried using a brush. So what kind of brush did you use? Well, I don't know. It was just a brush. It's like, <laughs> you can't use any brush. You know, it's like, you know, one of those things you tear out of a watercolor pack or something like that. And it's like, why doesn't my line not look like his? You know? I can't yeah. ink like Kirby. What's going on? He's supposed to use a brush, doesn't he? <laughs> oh, he's using the $30 brush. That's what he's doing. <laughs> of course, he can't go to the dollar store for that. <laughs> no, you can't. You can't. So that, I, finally what I did while working with him is I started to invest in better tools, you know. So, you know, I end up getting... My Windsor Newton brushes, which are what I use to ink with, and um, they're the best that you can get, and pretty much nothing else really compares from what I've heard. They're getting better, I hear, with the synthetics, but I'm not willing to risk it, <laughs> so <laughs> I just keep getting these while they're available. Um, and uh, that's what gives me that nice bold line, but it's got expression. You can go from a taper to heavy. You can uh, emphasize a curve, and you can create shadows really quickly, and, you know things like that. And for the rest of it, I use mostly use the brush on the characters. For the backgrounds, I use like a, a Croquel pen. So, um, and speedball pens for lettering and borders and things like that. <coughs> well, um, early, okay, let's, uh, earlier you mentioned uh, we kind of you were reading the, reading the comic to maintain kind of continuity. Let's yes. uh, talk a little bit about that. Since I mean, you've been drawing this comic for the past four years. I think you mentioned it started 2009, so that would be five at this point, I guess, then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like I said, I <laughs> I think of it in, in uh, daily newspaper years. Yeah. So really, as far as I'm concerned, I've counted them out. It's only a year and a half into a year newspaper half. syndication. Well, so even the, that. The story's that's... actually quicker paced. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, even that, even with a year and a half worth of strips, which would probably be... It's getting close to yeah. five, uh, five. close to five hundred or a little. Five hundred strips. Yeah. yeah. I, I think I did the math, thinking it was over four hundred, but I wasn't entirely certain. But yeah, even with with that many strips, I mean, that's a lot of world building and character development. Yeah. So how do, how do you maintain the I guess the continuity? I mean, uh, like kind of uh, offer me some advice maybe here because okay. uh, I've tried my hand on kind of like writing novels because I have a writing background and I have trouble like keeping like within one single book I have trouble keeping continuity well I think I start I start from a center and I work out mm -hmm. you know, clearly Ralph is the center and what is the essence of Ralph and Ralph is uh, my elevator pitch. You know, when I'm at a convention, you only have a few seconds to grab somebody as they're walking yeah. by. You know, it's like you know, um, and they ask, "Well, this is interesting. What is it?" Ralph is an alien who's been hired to destroy the planet Earth. <laughs> what they didn't know when they hired him is he's actually a really nice guy and kind of a procrastinator. <laughs> so, um, to write a character that's interesting to people, they have to identify with him. There's got to be something that they feel commonality. And what that usually means is um, the everyman can be described as the guy with problems. Okay, Superman is fantastic. Clark Kent is everyman, right? He, he pines for Lois Lane, but she doesn't know he's Superman, so she won't give him the time of day. 
You know, he has to look kind of goofy and he trips over stuff and, you know, has to be weak but because that's what people identify with. You know, he never quite gets the girl until lately, of course, you know, after the few decades now she knows and all that. And that's, that's cool because we have this huge mythology built already. But identifying with that character is important, so he has to have a conflict. And for me, I felt Ralph's conflict should be a conflict conscience because all I ever see, like, uh, like um, Independence Day, right? You know, the aliens come down and they're going to destroy the earth and there's nothing we can do about it. But this ragtag group of people are going to pull it together and use a, a MacBook to like go up there and crack their encryption codes and insert a virus into this giant ship, right? <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> I have a hard time believing anything that we have to offer would present any kind of obstacle to an alien species that can travel light years from their home. <laughs> And that's the way Ralph is written. Nobody can stop him. You know, he himself is virtually indestructible. You can't kill him. You can hurt him. You can intimidate him. But you can't really kill him. You can't make him go away. And you can't certainly can't take out his ship. All the nuclear weapons on this planet couldn't take that ship down. You know, um, it's a thousand miles across, and it's loaded with technology that we can't even comprehend. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, there's no, I, I believe the biggest, um, whether it comes to humor or, uh, or telling, a, you know, telling a story in, in a longer form, the things that mean the most to your audience or who's reading it are the things that they figure out inside of them. You know, they, they say like the, the way Homer the joke that's a way, you know, you're driving home and all of a sudden you're like, oh my god, that's what that was. You know, and you laugh out loud. It's so funny. Why did it get that reaction? Because it happened inside of you. It wasn't spoon-fed to you. It wasn't like out here, you know, like two guys slapping each other with fish. You know, it was something that you saw, you identified with, you processed, and once you started putting the pieces together, then you had a joke. You know what I mean? And then you had something that made sense to you. Or that's when you had an emotional connection. It happened inside. That's the beautiful thing about comic strips and comic books. It's not what happens in the panels. It's what happens between the panels. For the reader to make the connection, right? Right, or the readers make the connection. And that's what I'm trying to maintain. Um, it also gives you a little bit of flexibility as far as comic strips go because I don't have to go, okay, they're sitting at the table, then they go to the living room, and then they go from the living room to here. I can skip time because your brain fills in the gaps. And the more, you know, I mean, you can take that to an, ex, an extreme and then it's got no form at all, but, excuse me, mm -hmm. but if there's a little bit of gap that they fill in, then they feel more a part of the story. You know, it becomes more real to them. Um, but anyways, back to continuity, <laughs> where we were originally. Yeah. Um, I start with the character and I build up, why is he there? What's his conflict? He's got to have conflict. They don't have conflict. It's not interesting. If Superman were just Superman and he could literally blow out a sun and there was no weakness whatsoever, we wouldn't identify with him and there'd be nothing interesting to tell. It'd just be this big super guy who does stuff. And you know that you see some of that in like the old, you know, Greek mythology and things like that. And it's just like they're not buying that. You know, they they need something more personal. And I think in some ways that's that's what Marvel Comics capitalized on over DC initially was the ability to make heroes that were flawed and people would identify with them. You know, that's why the X-Men, the X-Men, pretty much any teenager identified with the X-Men, right? <laughs> Very true. <laughs> and, you know, and you just had these various characters, but they always had some kind of flaw that made them personable. You know, you could relate to that particular weakness or that kind of, you know, Peter Parker and, oh, he's in love with this girl, but he can't tell her that he's Spider-Man and, you know, and then he's got to save her and, you know, everybody will be after her if they know and, you know, these internal conflicts and that's important. You know, I think those old thought balloons where he's thinking it all out and trying to figure out what he's going to do is part of what made the character personable to people, you know, um, and that's important. Part of that is knowing what the conflicts are for that for that pivotal character. Um, and then I start building out from there, you know, who will, you know, reinforce the conflict, who will present, um, you know, it's, it, you know, contract and relax kind of thing, you know. Um, 
you, you're always looking for these peaks and valleys where things get really tense and then you relax the tension, you know, either with humor or a happy ending kind of feeling or something along those lines. But you're always moving through the water headed in a, a specific direction. Now, for instance, I know how this all ends. Um, <laughs> You're not going mean, to share it with us, though, right? No, I'm not going to share that. <laughs> <laughs> because I think it's a really cool ending. Um, <laughs> and I'm hoping no one will see it coming. But <clears throat> you can't always write based on people not seeing it coming, either. Uh, there was a little reveal about Aaron, if you read all the way through. Um, and I could have saved that for much later, but there's a more interesting aspect than the reveal that can come a little later on, which I will think will elicit far more emotional satisfaction um, in reading it than just trying to surprise somebody like, oh, this person or that person is doing this. You know, um, this could happen to Kaiser, you know, or this could happen to, you know, Ray's going to do this, you know. Surprising people is, um, is, you know, it has its merit, but if you rely too heavily on the surprise, you run into the fact that, there are people out there who are much smarter than you. <laughs> yeah. And there are plenty of people much smarter than I am. Yeah. Which is why I don't write Ralph as a smart alien, because yeah. i got to write what I know, which yeah. is not... You know, <laughs> i got to stay within a certain circle there. You know, so. but, um, but if you constantly rely, rely on shock, or, ooh, I'm going to come up with a good plot twist... Well, people figure that out, and that's not ultimately it's not satisfying. But if they if they enjoy the characters, they can always enjoy the characters. So that's a ride. You know, I think of it going to an amusement park. You know, you go on, you go on, you get on a roller coaster. It goes up, it goes down. You scream, you laugh. You come to the end, you go, wow, that was a great ride. <laughs> you don't think necessarily about the part where. Oh, it went over the top and you could feel the tracks come off. Or, you know, <laughs> you went around this corner really sharp and I felt like all the spit rides. You know, you might remember those, but what you remember in the long run was the feeling that the overall thing gave you. The thrill. you know, it wasn't that you were suddenly surprised by this turn or this peak. It was how the whole ride made you feel. And that's how I try to write. Um, keeping in mind that the characters are going to develop and be interesting to people ultimately to create a long-term ride. I, like I said, I'm creating this comic strip not so I can like slap out some gags, have somebody laugh, and then be done with it. I want to create something that lasts decades, to be honest. Um, you know, I, when I uh, was reading uh, Cartoonist Profiles, which was a magazine from way back that all cartoonists read and interviewed professional cartoonists and whatnot, um, and um, you know, I, I read about a book called uh, Your Career in Cartooning by Lee Nordling. And I went and I got that book. I still have it. You know, it's old and it's binders loose. But I used to tear through that all the time. And it was interviews with all these different syndicate editors, with cartoonists. And it prese presented different views from people in different positions in the industry. Like cartoonists had a similar kind of feel. All the editors, syndicate editors had a certain feel. And newspaper editors had a certain kind of feel. And he went and he basically took... Uh, opinions from each of them about what made comics great or what the experience was like and doing different aspects of it. And one of the things they said is that most people are not prepared when they get into it because when they used to sign contracts for a cartoonist, they were for a minimum of 11 years, um, which is a fairly, fairly beefy piece of time to spend yeah. doing anything. Um, now, they've trimmed that down over the years because things are a lot more fickle in newspapers. So they went down to five years, and now I think they're down to like two years or something like for contracts. But, the, you know, they'll just renew them if it's good. But the, the initial term was like 11 years or something like that. And I thought, wow, I'm going to have to keep coming up with material for 11 years if I sign this, <laughs> at least 11 years. So part of the reason for me kind of building this world and creating this, this mythology was that I would always have something to kind of follow for that time period. Mm -hmm. Now, the strip itself is kind of a microcosm, you know, day-to-day, moment-to-moment kind of thing. You know, it's like Ralph and Lexi are walking down the street. That could take a week. 
mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> it could take a month, you know, depending on what they get into, you know, um, at the Comic Con, you know, that was uh, probably a few weeks at least, you know, a run there, at least a couple weeks, I think. Um, and then, you know, there's other things where time passes rather quickly, like the time he spends with Thane to eventually coming up here. Actually, a couple months or so go by between the time when he, he leaves and by the time he actually finds Lexi. Oh. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, there's time passes in strange ways, but um, if there's a consistency in that. Like I said, that's why it's a fun medium because I can kind of, I got a little bit of leeway in that respect. Um, but um, but I always have this this long-term construct that I'm kind of building off of, and I can say, well, I can move quicker through this area, but this area I kind of want to stretch out because there's something going on there. I want to make sure that I emphasize this, so I'll spend a little time on it. But this this is good for a good joke, so I'll use that. But then I'll just move on from there, you know. But I have this mm-hmm. this long-term kind of thing. It's like I know I can get plenty of jokes out of this while he's here doing this. Um, the thing for me was is I realized once I started building it, it really kind of got out of control. <laughs> I had no idea it was going to be this big. And then I realized it's like, holy smoke, I could put a whole other story on this. Um, and, and I actually, if I can do it, one of the things I'd like to do is run the strip and also run a comic book series at the same time. And the comic book series would focus more on where he came from, how he got to be the destroyer, and actually the end of the story, where he ends up going and the decisions that he makes and how that affects where he came from and the Earth. Because, um, yeah, it's kind of, he's, he's like on this pivotal point, really. <laughs> he could really mess things up or he could do something really great. Or he could do something great for one and something terrible for the other, you know. Yeah, he's kind of like at a fork in the road where one decision will lead him to a greatness, the other one will <laughs> keep him on the on the destroyer path, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the path of light, the path of darkness, something of that nature. However you want to look at it, you know, obscurity, fame, whichever. <laughs> <you know. laughs> All right, well, here's a key question. Okay. What makes Ralph so adorable? <laughs> <laughs> well... I, I, that's a hard one for me to explain in some ways, um, because I mean, I think even sometimes, his computer says so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he is. Um, no, I know exactly why he's physically adorable, and it's funny because um, when I'm at a uh, comic convention and I got my banner behind me, um, which I don't know if is visible or not. It is visible. Yeah. Oh, it is With the little um, bird on his head. <laughs> I get a very high. Oh, factor. <laughs> All the girls that walk by, they see it, they're like, oh, it's so cute. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and uh, actually, because of that, I mean, it seems there's, I get a fairly broad base. I'm surprised. You know, I get a lot, some people who are much older, some little a girl as young as eight reading it, um, you know, and I basically aim it at, you know, 10 and up. I mean, you know, but there's nothing in it that's offensive that, you know, a little kid could read. It's just that they might not necessarily grasp some of the concepts. But that was one of the great things. Uh, I got this great mention on Facebook about this family I met at uh, Pittsburgh Comic Con, which I regularly frequent. And, um, and they said some really nice things. They said, you know, how she loved the book and she read through the whole thing. And he was surprised how much that she comprehended that was he thought would be above her head, but she really kind of got it. And she was really excited about meeting the artist and stuff like that. I was like, that makes me feel good. You know, it's like I'm doing something that they can share with their kids. I mean, if you think about it, there's not a lot of stuff, unfortunately, anymore, um, either on TV or in comics sometimes, that you can really share with your kids without thinking, you know, I don't know if I want to deal with that subject at this moment. Or, you know, that asks too many questions that I don't want to deal with in a certain way, you know, or... I mean, it used to be they would mention things and it would kind of go over your head if you were a little kid. You know, if you didn't get it, you just you just didn't comprehend it. You know, what the subject was. Um, you might have gotten might have gotten the feel of what it was, but you didn't really. You know, you didn't have to worry about profanity or you know, some kind of 
innuendo or something like that going on that was inappropriate. And, and because I aim it at newspapers, I hold myself to that standard. You know, I try not to produce anything that I have to worry about somebody going, oh, I don't want my kid to see that, you know. Or if an adult is reading it and their kid comes up and they go, oh, <laughs> <That kind of thing. laughs> close, close, close. <laughs> you don't want to have to do that, you know. And I think that kind of creates a, a feeling of well-being, you know, kind of more peaceful, too. Um, I know there's a lot of movies I like, and I understand when language is used or something like that, but you know what? I feel more relaxed when I don't have to deal with it. Because um, sometimes uh, using strong language, it, people don't realize that it's, it's, a, it's an attack. I mean, be honest, like when you use profanity as someone, you're attacking them verbally, usually. And so when you hear that, you feel like whatever the medium is, it's attacking you, and you can feel your blood pressure go up a little bit, you know. And that's not what I want. If, if I want the blood pressure to go up, I want it to be over an emotional reaction that's substantial. It has to do with character interaction or empathy or, you know, oh, that little girl drives me nuts. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? And, and that makes it, it also allows you to get a broader audience which is what I want. I want as broad an audience as possible. Um, and also since my goal is newspapers in the end, um, I want it to be, I don't want to have to create two separate strips. You know, it's like, oh, this is the, this is the fun one I do on the internet, and this is the, the, this, you know, the much more uh, subdued one that I do on, on for the newspapers. I've seen a lot of web cartoons do that. And you know what? They quit after a year or two because they don't want to do it. Me... The thing I love about comics is creating inside the box. Everybody likes to talk about you know thinking outside the box, right? I like to think inside the box. Some of those restrictions actually help me to be to have to go further, to run a little deeper to find something. You know, uh, like I said, rather than slapping somebody with a wet fish, you have to think through it and actually try and trick them, outthink them to get them to find the humor in it. And then when they do, it happens inside, and it's a deeper, more meaningful gag in that respect. Um, and that's my feeling. Everybody has their own way. Everybody has their own angle. I'm not saying people who do that stuff are bad or something yeah. like that. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying what I hold myself to, and these are the reasons why. Yeah. And um, everybody has their own take on it. And that's the kind of audience that you're looking for. Then that's the kind of content that you'll create. And this is the kind of audience that I want to create for. I want to create for as broad an audience as possible. The kind of thing, like I said, when I was growing up and I read the newspaper comics, that's what I liked. And that's what I'm trying to create. In fact, some of the stuff that was even older than that. Um, you know, I remember artwork from like Pogo and you know some of the old uh, Gasoline Alley strips and they were just beautifully drawn and I said, man, wish I could do that. You know. Uh, sometimes I look at comics and I go, yeah, I could do that. And I'm afraid most people do. And I think we've kind of lost our admiration for it in some respects because they've been shrinking them down and simplifying them so much that sometimes people don't feel like um, it's special in that respect. You, know, you want to see something that, like, wow, I wish I could draw like that as opposed to, yeah, I think I could do that. <laughs> you <know? laughs> or, you know, somebody reads something. I mean, I'm sure... As a journalist or you know somebody who can appreciate writing, there's like there are writers who are just like, how on earth did they do that? They started out here and they brought me back around, and I couldn't believe it. And it just brought you know, and you're just like, wow, I wish I could do that, you know. As opposed to you see somebody who writes something that's just like, blah, you know, <laughs> all out on the page, you know, it's right there, and you go, yeah, I, yeah, I guess it doesn't really grab you, it doesn't inspire you, you know. And I always wanted to be somebody who could. I wanted to do something that would inspire other people. Maybe, maybe like I said, I'm not the best at it, or somebody's always going to be a better artist or a better writer, but I would always hope to reach a level. You know, I'm, I'm always reaching myself for a level that I believe is out there that I'm trying to get a hold of. Um, I know every day that I reach out, it's going to move a little further ahead, but that's part of that's part of the pro you know that's part of what it is to reach to be to try and do something excellent is to always be reaching for more um, I there's always things I can do to make this look better or 
uh, things I can do to sharpen my writing, and I'm always look, trying to find those things. But if I don't hold myself and say, "Darn it, I'm going to try better," you know, I'm going to next time it's going to go this far, you know, then you know, we as just human beings, if we don't have that higher goal, we'll sit on our couch and fall asleep. <laughs> With a bowl of potato chips on our stomach, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> so, are you your own worst critic in that regard? Then? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm brutal. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I can hate like the whole time that I'm doing it. To be honest, mm -hmm. um, I'm just like, oh, this is awful. No, 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 <laughs> that can't be it. And I'm always going back and like. But at the same time, having worked on it professionally. Um, you know, having worked on Nancy, you know, and other things where you got a deadline, you have to do it. There has to be a cutoff point where you say, okay, I got to let it go. You know, I did the best that I could, and I hope that that's enough. You know, you might fix a couple little things, but you can't go back and redraw it every single time. It'll take forever. You know, and I'm, I'm kind of a slow, methodical person to begin with, so I can't, <laughs> I can't take too much time. That's why I said earlier, you know, that when I did this strip, how much can I put into it in a day? You know, how many strips can I do comfortably, and how much art can I do in the strip within a week? Because if it takes me longer than a week to produce seven strips, what good is it? Because then I can't put it in newspapers. You know, I'll be putting it on the web or whatever, but that wasn't my goal. My goal was newspapers. So I said, I have to produce this many comic strips in whole, in a week. And if I try to do more artwork and I try to get too carried away with it, it's going to go past that point and then I'm, <laughs> I'm up against a wall which I could get in real big trouble for. So I, I always try to focus on, even if I'm doing a single one, how much time I spend on it or, or you know what I can do. And Even if I break it up, like I can only work on it an hour or two this night, I'll pencil, I'll write and pencil this night and then I'll come back tomorrow and I'll do this for this much time. Um, so I always have a, a reference frame that I'm not getting out of, you know. Um, some some artists are absolutely amazing. I mean, I remember going through the papers, you see something like Prince Valiant, and, you know, it was a Sunday. That guy, I don't know how much time, I think he spent all week working on that one Sunday, you know. But you could tell when you looked at it, it's just like, yeah, somebody pretty much painted this, you know. <laughs> um, you know, some of the old uh, strips like... Uh, Winnie Winkle and you know some of these different things. It's just like the artwork was amazing. I mean, they were drawing like, like almost like the old catalog style artwork. I mean, it was just everything was just like absolutely perfect, and it almost looked like somebody had inked over a photograph. You know, um, and you know if you can get that done in time to do it every day, that's quite a feat. I can't do that, but I can do this. This is uh, this is a blend for me between comic strip and animation in, her, in, her, in that aspect. Um, when I first started drawing I learned from uh, Preston Blair books um, which were all about animation. He was a Disney animator. and uh, So that's how I started learning it, uh, all those principles. And uh, you know as I read comics I saw different things and tried to absorb some of those and integrate it all in the hopes that I would create my own art style eventually. Um, but those things were important because you can't just have style, <laughs> whatever that is. <laughs> I've kind of dis discerned that for some people, style is, I don't know how to do this correctly, so I'm just going to say it's style. <laughs> yeah. there, there are rules for art, or at least there's rules for good art, um, whether it's writing or, <laughs> or drawing. Um, and just because you adhere to some of those doesn't make it any less artistic. Yeah. Um, so you know, I use those to build and create solid character. You couldn't reproduce a character from pose to pose if they didn't have some kind of consistency to them. If they didn't have some structure underneath them, and that's how the story is as well. The story has structure underneath it, even though it appears to change and move and do different things as we're moving along. Um, so, how will we see Ralph's story develop in the future? What can we expect? Um. Well, let's see. We'll see uh, Ray become more involved, if you remember Ray. Yeah, the, I remember him <laughs> going to the bank and asking if they had been robbed. <laughs> so he's a very interesting character. Oh, yeah. Ray is, Ray is pretty much a, a one-dimensional character. 
but he plays that note really well. Um, yeah. But, um, yeah, we'll see more of Ray, that's for sure. Um, and there are some characters that have not yet been introduced that uh, will be in the future. Um, there, this is not the end of the character list. It's it's the bulk of it. If you read up to the present, it's most of the characters. But there are still one or two that um, have yet to be introduced that uh, will play, play a pretty pivotal role. Um, Any more aliens, or is it just Ralph? Um, well, some of it will be, will probably, I'll be delving a little bit into Ralph's past, you know, in different places. Um, we've seen some of the aliens already that he has to deal with. Some are more advanced than he is, obviously. Um, you know, there's one that in particular that kind of follows him around, um, and they're, they're um, non-corporeal, you know, so they're beyond time. They see things differently, you know, and he, they, they're kind of guiding him along to see if he makes the right choice or not. Um, and also they kind of have a, it's been mentioned that he has a mission already that he's kind of ignoring and he's not doing that he's supposed to be getting back to. <laughs> and they, they make no small bones about that. Um, but uh, yeah, so there's actually a lot going on and it's, I try to make sure that within the context of a day, daily that something is complete which is kind of, you know, uh, you remember For Better or For Worse, the uh, comic strip uh, by Lynn Johnson, For Better or For yeah, Worse? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That was her, that was the way she did it, and I really liked that kind of storytelling. What she was, she was telling an overall arc story, but each strip that you read had kind of a punchline and a completeness to it. Mm -hmm. Like if you just walked in and you read one strip, you'd get something out of it, you know? Um, but if you stuck with it, you were rewarded with more. You were rewarded with a mythology that kind of got you thinking and trying to keep track of where these people were, and, and then that stimulates your thought. Um, and she did that as well um, with the family. Now I'm just doing it with an alien, you know, and it's a similar idea. Um, because I never, for me, even though I very much appreciate the, um, the old serial comics, like uh, 3G or Winnie Winkle and any of those. The art was fantastic, and um, they did have quite a story going on if you could follow it. But as a little kid, I had a hard time following those <laughs> because when you'd get two panels, and it would be like somebody walking through the door and like, oh, Mark, you know, and it's like, Jane, you know, kind of thing. And it's just like, what's going on here? I have no idea what's going on here. <laughs> it was two takes, and I don't know what's going on. And I was very frustrated by that. So I never wanted that to be what I was doing. I wanted you to come into it, you kind of get an idea where they are, introduce the gag, you get a little punchline or something going on, you know, some emotional response, and it's complete. But if you come back, you're, you're asking yourself, wait, it looks like there might be more to this. And you come back and you find out there is more to this. And then it kind of hooks you, and you want to keep finding out what's going on. Will he ever push the button? Will Lexi ever find someone who will listen to her and, like, do something about this menace? You know, um, is Ralph going to get his head blown off again by the giant cockroach? You know, is, uh, <laughs> you know what's going to happen? You know, uh, what about the men in black? Are they going to find a way to capture him? You know, um, what, what, you know, there's a lot of questions up in the air and a lot of people running around you know, and uh, in kind of fire drill format that uh, it will all be answered eventually. Um, but, uh, like I said, I do have a, a finish line in mind, and um, I know where I want to go with it. It doesn't mean I have the whole story, like, all written out exactly, like I have this, 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 and this, and this, this. I actually have Ralph's history, for the most part, written out. Okay. Um, but I don't have, like... From where it is right now, I don't have like every idea. Because to be honest, I like creating the characters, putting them in a situation, and then see what they do to each other, you know, kind of thing. I, I do literally, I'm, it's like I'm running a, a, a almost like a, a simulator in my head, you know, kind of thing. It's just like I know this is how this person will react. I know this. What logical actions will they take, you know, or illogical because that's the way they're, you know, they are. You know, Beth is unpredictable. You never know what she's going to do. But does it have some other meaning? Is she being, you know, is there something else going on there? Um, I know how Ralph is probably going to react, you know, um, for the most part. Lexi's got a pretty standard movement. But when you throw him into a situation, 
that neither of them is particularly ready for. You know, how, how do they deal with that situation or how these other characters deal with certain situations. Um, you know, uh, Ralph has developed a crush, you know, and now Lexi's trying to get him to uh, have a relationship with this person because she feels like if he if he finds love, you know, he can't blow up the planet because, you know, he just can't blow up the planet that your girlfriend's on. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that, but, see, that's the thing with Lexi. It's a simple methodology. I try not to write Lexi like she's, like, she's really thinking this out, you know, she's got a very adult mentality. She's not. She's a little girl. She's looking at it like a little girl would, you know, um, and that's that's important because if she becomes too adult, then all of a sudden she's not Lexi anymore. That's It kind of... You know, there are adults I can talk like that through. I don't do that with her. You know, she, very simple, you know, it's like love is wonderful. I know all about romance. How can you know about, that much about romance at eight, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but they got this built-in kind of like, I know all about it. I can tell you everything that, you know. And, of course, you know that's a recipe for disaster. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, um, yeah. Yeah. That's the, that's the direction that it goes, you know, and uh, I like allowing them to kind of do, and doing that also, it allows it, the story to go in directions I wouldn't have necessarily thought that it would. I have to resolve certain problems that come up um, and be smart about it because I can't just say, at the end, I can't just go, yeah, that wasn't working out, so let's just shift gears here. You know, I have to actually go, oh, well, they kind of got into a situation how the heck are they going to get out of that? <laughs> you know? And it has to be a reasonable thing based on things that I've already written. It can't just be like, you know, out of left field, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Some things are kind of out of left field, but I've already established that they're oddities and that they do occasionally happen, you know. Um, you know, so that that's yeah. part of my story writing process, I guess. Well, it all sounds good, and I can't wait to see what uh, comes in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Neither can I. <laughs> I'm pretty excited about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, those, those were kind of all the questions that I, I kind of came prepared with you, but if you have anything else you'd like to add, I mean, this is your podium. We are your fans. Uh, <laughs> well, I appreciate that. I appreciate fans. I do very much. <laughs> um, you know, it's one of the nice things about going to comic conventions is you get to meet the people who read it and who are excited to see it, you know. Yeah. Um, and even the people who've never read it before, you know, once they know what it's about, they're like, oh, that's a really neat idea. Mm -hmm. And then they take it home and they come back and like, that was great. Do you have the second book? You know, it's just like, yes, I do. Oh. <laughs> it's <by> my book. <laughs> Which for anybody who wants to know... Books are available on Amazon if you look up Ralph the Destroyer. There's um, the soft cover books, which are in black and white, which are compilations of the story. And there's also uh, Kindle versions available, too. Um, so. And if anybody wants to meet you in person, what's the next comic convention that you'll be attending? Um, as of today, the next one that I will be attending, I believe, is the Awesome Con in Washington, D.C. I'm going mm -hmm. with a group of other web cartoonists there. Um, they're kind of setting up some deals to work together to try and get the the uh, indie group you know some attention because there's a lot of celebrities pouring into it so they're trying to market a little better so I'm in with them uh, there's a bunch of other cartoonists in there um, so uh, yeah I'll be at the awesome con I haven't got my booth number yet mm -hmm. but as soon as I do I'll probably be making that known on my website on Facebook and Twitter and stuff like that um, which I, I know, I still got to get that social media stuff working. That's <laughs> it's yeah. hard for me. I'm, a, I'm an old-time old recluse, you know, so I'm not used to that stuff as much. <laughs> yeah, but in the meantime, anyone can follow your work at ralphthedestroyer.com. So. Yep, that's absolutely right. And I, like I said, I do have a Facebook fan page, and I have a personal Facebook page. Um, so new posts are put up there if you're trying to keep track of it. It also posts on Twitter if you have a Twitter account, too. Um, and um, let's see, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Um, pretty much every year I'm at the Pittsburgh mm -hmm. Comic Con, um, if anybody's in that area. Um, and that's a really nice show to go to. Um, so far I've been to uh, Pittsburgh, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and um, now I'll be going to Awesome Con in Washington. I'm, I'm slowly working my way out. Um, I live in Connecticut, and we have some conventions here, but... 
the state is kind of weird about tax issues, so I don't even bother. Anymore. Ah, well, <laughs> what can you do? Everybody else is open arms. If I go to any other state, it's like, yeah, don't worry about that stuff. Come on in. Sell your mm-hmm. stuff. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> That's what I like to hear. But, um, yeah, so I'm, work- I'm working my way out, basically. Any place that I can drive, I'll, you know, I'll go to. And uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Um, I mentioned the books. Um, hmm. Yeah, lately I've been updating on um, once a week, and um, I'm hoping you know once I get a few projects off my table, I'll be going back to three times a week because um, I really prefer that that rhythm myself. Um, it hasn't changed the way that I write it, but I know people prefer a little a little more update. Although I do see a lot of weeklies on online. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We we look forward to having more more content, more Ralph the Destroyer. <laughs> we want to see what where where his hijinks take him. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and there's a lot. There's actually a lot going on there um, that will happen. I mean, uh, I'm definitely planning on putting Ralph in some interesting situations uh, that he's not at all prepared for, because that's what life is all about. <laughs> yeah. Constantly being challenged and having to overcome those obstacles. Um, but there is a purpose to it, and uh, it's all about. Actually, some of the some of what it's all about has already been mentioned in the comic strip itself. Mm-hmm. Um, I have some themes going on there, things that I'm trying to express. I don't view the strip as merely, you know, when I was talking about being um, a broad audience or working within, you know, mm-hmm. the panels and whatnot. I wasn't trying to say that. Um, I'm not trying to say anything. I'm just trying to say things that are have a broader appeal or things that most people can identify with. Um, there may even be serious subjects that comic strips deal with, like I remember you know, people talk about, oh, Calvin and Hobbes is like the funniest strip. Everyone makes me laugh out loud. Really? The dead bird sequence made you laugh out loud? No, but it made you feel something, yeah. right? And that's the importance is it makes you feel something. Maybe it makes, makes you feel happy. Maybe it makes you angry or, you know. Yeah. Us about a certain subject or an issue, you know, that we all have feelings about, you know, and that's, you know, and that's what's important. Um, you're creating art that people who see the art get something out of it. They may get something different than you intend, but they get something out of it. And uh, that's something I'm always curious to see is like what different people draw out of it. You know, some people see different things than I necessarily what I was thinking. It's just like. Yeah, I could see that. That's interesting, you know. <laughs> I would always hope that there'd be some debate, you know, as to what the meaning was behind certain things. But, you know, I, I run metaphors through it. I run, you know, personal little thing experiences that I've had all through it. You know, write what you know, right? So I'm just writing it with a heavy metaphor over the surface of it so you don't necessarily see what it is, you know. Sometimes it's not that hidden, <laughs> to be honest. But you don't see it because Ralph is an alien, you know. Yeah. Um, oh, that's where I was. Why is Ralph cute? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Big, well, adorable. Come back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Ralph is cute because I draw him like a baby. <laughs> oh. There are certain standards that you use to, like, if you study how the face ages versus, you know, when you're an infant versus an adult, certain, uh, like, larger eyes, smaller, rounder cheeks, you know. Um, and also with the advantage of Ralph is he has antenna, which I can use, like, puppy dog ears. <laughs> they flop. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's attentive, you know. He's sad, you know. He's, <laughs> he's like, agitated, you know. <laughs> and that's what well, makes him so expressive and why people, I think, get into the character because... Nothing is hidden, you know. He's not. He's got no poker face whatsoever. He's just <laughs> everything is just right out there, you know. And at the same time, nobody sees it, you know. It's just like he's just carrying on to them. It's just like, yeah, whatever, you know. <laughs> yeah, he's an open book, and uh, yeah. it's, it, I think his personality also really makes him adorable as well. It, it's yeah. a big factor. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, because if he was like closed off, he'd be closed off to the audience as well. You know, so he has to he has to be constantly expressing something, and sometimes the gag is just the way he looks at things, or he, you know, he's, the response that he has about something. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, that's you know, 
that's part of the the joy of him is that you know he doesn't try necessarily to hide anything. He's he's just all out there, you know, and he's he's trying it. He's trying to experience it. And everything is wonderful, and then it's absolutely terrible. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll never do this again. Well, maybe just one more time. <laughs> you know, and I think we all feel that way at some point or another. You know, we, we we identify with that weakness and that you know sudden burst of strength and you know and and joy, and then it's just like uh, complete depression. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's I, that's what I think people lock on to um, is that yeah he's a cute character he's designed I mean he's got you know he's got a, and a little belly you know he's a little round he's got, you know floppy ears and giant eyes you know and uh, yeah I deliberately tried to make him look as cute as I could because you know of you know one of the things that people said they didn't like you know made it impossible to make them empathetic was that they're not cute or they're they're scary looking you know or something like that so I deliberately drew him to be as cute as inhumanly possible. <laughs> Is that why all the animals like congregate to him and he becomes like <laughs> almost like a Disney princess? <laughs> <laughs> there is a reason for that beyond that, um, and oh. I'll get into that later actually. Um, okay. <laughs> so you'll go into that later on, huh? Yeah, he actually mentioned this in uh, the Thane sequence, or. Um, I'm not sure. I'm trying to remember if it was with Thane or Lexi when they're talking about uh, Defender, and uh, I think it's with Thane. I'm trying to remember. Um, and uh, basically, is uh, Ralph is going to go looking for an evil mentor because he's really bad at being evil. Mm -hmm. So that's a that's a potential future storyline that could uh, come into play. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, that is wrought with all kinds of consequences thereof. Um, how exactly do you learn that if it, <laughs> if it doesn't come naturally to you already? Um, and also, what, what is their motivation for teaching him? Um, so, uh, and that person has already been somewhat brushed against. I haven't really, you haven't, we haven't seen him, but he's been talked about. So he'll come into play later on. Um, and in fact, that brings in the other, the one of the one of the other final characters, um, which I can have some fun with too. But <laughs> but I'm trying to take it slow. I did, you know, when I did this, almost the uh, the first, I don't know how many, probably 200 strips were almost just like Ralph talking about. You know, he's on the go through talking to himself basically and going through all these silly adventures that he went through and describing it. And then I s introduce Thane, and then I introduce Lexi, and you know, slowly working it through um, in a kind of a methodical order. So I don't I'm trying not to rush things because I do have a a long road ahead of me. So I'm trying to pace it out, and hopefully it stays interesting and zany along the way. So. <laughs> Uh, if I do say so myself, you've been very successful so far. <laughs> oh, well, thank you very much. I appreciate. It. Uh, certainly, somebody who's studying, you know, journalism writing that yeah. means a lot. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, I'm an open book. You know, <laughs> so that's that's kind of you know where I write from. You know, it's, a lot of Ralph just comes from my experience. You know, dealing with things. I think you know, growing up. That's just the way I kind of looked at things. I always felt like a little bit on the outside, you know, looking in, and I'm like, well, wait, why, why do you do that? Like, what do you mean, why do we do that? That's that's just the way we always do it, you know. Um, yeah, but why? <laughs> and that was always my question, you know. Um, it's a story about the pot. Uh, what was it? The the leg of ham. I don't know if you're familiar with that story. There's a story where the daughter goes to her mom and she's cooking and she's got this um, this ham leg basically and you know, I forget it's like the stump you've seen the old hands where they just kind of round like this kind of pear shaped thing yeah, yeah yeah and she puts it in the pan and she uh, she cuts off the end the round end a little nub she cuts it off and she throws it away and she goes to put it in the oven and uh, her daughter says to her mommy why do you cut the end off she goes oh well um, hmm I'm not sure um, I just know my, my mother did it all the time so she cooks it, and 
you know, the next day they're going, you know, we should ask her about that. Why, why does she? So they go and they visit to the little girl's grandmother and they say, you know, hey, Grandma, how you doing? And it's like, oh, fine, how are you doing? She's like, you always cook those hams. Um, you always cut the end off. Was that to, like, release the flavor or, or to cook it more thoroughly? And she goes, oh, well, I did that. Um, hmm. I did that because... Huh. I did that because my mother always did it. So they go, they go, and they visit the great-grandmother, and they go, great-grandma. Grandma said that you always cut the end of the ham off. Why did you do that? You know, was it to release the flavor or cook it more thoroughly or anything like that? Oh no, that was because during the depression we only had one pot and the ham wouldn't fit, so I cut it off. <laughs> well, at least there's an explanation for it. <laughs> <laughs> but see, you know, we always get into doing things and we don't think about why, you know. And Ralph wants to know why because he's never seen it before. This is the first yeah. time, his first experience. So everything is interesting and wonderful in that respect. And. You know, at the same time, he's he's running for his life because all this other stuff is happening around him. You know, and, uh, he's got these responsibilities that are bearing down, and he he wants to fulfill them and do something great. At the same time, he's afraid to because his conscience is in conflict. You know, and it creates a very complex situation. At the same time, it's not so complex that most people can't say, "Yeah, I know how that feels." You know. I felt the weight of the world bearing on me, and I wrestled with my conscience, or, you know, I felt, I felt completely out of my element, or wasn't that absolutely wonderful when you see something simple like a, a baby smile for the first time, or you know, or, you know, this this little thing. You remember being a kid and running through the grass and how wonderful that was, or you know, just just little visceral things like that. And I think it's important to bring back a little bit of that wonder, and uh, I think people appreciate. It. I think that's why. You know, parents enjoy their kids as they get to relive the world a little bit through them to because everything's new, everything's wonderful, and it's like awesome, you know. And they love to see that and it's like I remember when I felt that way. And I'm trying to create that similar feeling with Ralph in that respect. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> That's uh it's it's definitely is definitely the the impression that I'm getting. Everything is new to Ralph and it's it's amazing seeing the world through his eyes. So <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I've gotten a few comments about that, you know, that yeah. he has like a kind of a naive look about things yeah. that's just really attractive. It's just like, you know, he just, everything is so interesting, you know, and it's just like I didn't, I guess I didn't realize how much I was doing that, you know, um, when I write for him. But I guess, yeah, just for him, I know that that's, I just have this understanding that that's how he would look. And I always like humor. Um, based on that kind of situation, um, very often, uh, you know, <laughs> I was always the guy that um, when people would say something off color, I'd try to find some way to flip it. You know, like somebody would say, uh, "You can put that where the sun don't shine," and I go, "Seattle, Washington." <laughs> <laughs> oh, See, that's, that's funny, right? <laughs> well, it is funny, but at the same time, it's a pretty low blow to their weather, but. <laughs> But you know, but, yeah. So I like to flip it like that, yeah, you know, yeah. because you got an innocent view. People don't expect the innocent view because we've all become so worldly as we've gotten older, and we take ourselves so seriously that we ref we almost associate innocence with being stupid, and it's not the same thing. It's not even ignorance isn't stupid. It's just not knowing, you know. Um, and people think it's an insult, but it's not. You know, and Ralph is a little bit of both. He's innocent. He is ignorant because he's never been here. He doesn't know what's going on. But he's also innocent because he chooses to look at things in the best light. You know, um, and he just expects things to be wonderful if they can be. You know, he gets here and he sees a planet and it's like, ooh, it's pretty. <laughs> well, let's hold off just a little bit. Let's let's go take a look, shall we? <laughs> he starts making excuses right away. You know. Um, and that's what we like. We want to see that. We want to see somebody who who's curious and enjoying and wants to, you know, live yeah. life. Who's you know, and uh, part of that for me is is you know Ralph has been kind of like hidden away and kind of kept down for a long time in his past. And you see a little bit of that in his story. Um, you know, not being able to get a good job anywhere. Or, you know, he's kind of like hidden away. Collecting windows for 140 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
I can I can think that would get tiring after that long. Yeah. It's... <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you know. But you know, and part of that is is um, and I'll, I'm I'm actually coming to a place where I'll tell a little bit more about his backstory in that respect. You know, um, mm -hmm. why he kind of craves, you know, a little bit of sunlight in that respect. You know. Um, but there's a there's actually quite a twisty story about how he comes to be actually um, based on his planet's history mm -hmm. um, and how they come to be. Um, I've talked a little bit about in the strip. I've talked a little bit about his planet's history, but there's actually this long protracted thing that occurs that kind of makes his people the most dreaded species in the known universe. You know that that area of the. Supermass or whatever you call it, <laughs> the, the collection of galaxies, you know, that's out there. Um, but um, you know, and that's all important because in his in his eyes, he's trying to redeem not only himself, but he's trying to redeem his people in some respect too. Um, but he's not a hundred percent sure that what he's doing is the right thing to do in order to do that. And so he's always kind of like putting it off because he's not sure. He's second guessing himself. Now that he's made these decisions, now he's second guessing himself, <laughs> and he's like right in the middle of it. So, uh, you know, and I'll get into that a little bit more um, in the strip. I'm, I'm always fighting to see how much I can put in the strip versus what I have to wait and put into a, a medium that would accept a larger story. Because um, you you write differently for a comic book, even a funny one, than you would for a comic strip. You know, there's Comic strips tend to be little day-to-day -day things, and that's one of the things I love because you get to see, excuse me, Ralph and Lexi talking about silly things and you know, life or death, mm -hmm. and then something completely bombastic like unicorns, you know, or <laughs> and it's just all the little stuff that happens that makes perfect sense for those two people to to have a conversation like that. Um, but at the same time, there's bigger things that I can touch on, but I can't really express the full magnitude of it because it is a limited space. Mm -hmm. So I have to accept that. I'll have to look for another opportunity to express that in some way. Or I'll trim down a little bit of it and I'll hint at it and like I said, if I come out with a graphic novel or a series of comic books or something like that, then you go, oh, there's a lot more story to grab onto there. you know. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it won't just be a retread of what you've already seen. It'll actually be building on the foundation that was already there um, and expand it more fully. So that's the goal anyways, you know. <laughs> oh, wish you definitely the best of luck. I look definitely look forward to more. So. Well, for as long as I for as long as I can still draw, I'll be trying to plug away at it certainly. <laughs> um, <laughs> hopefully on the web, even more hopefully, like I said, uh, um if I can do this and uh, Get it in newspapers. That would be fantastic. I'd love to get a nice broad audience like that. I, I think it would, it would really benefit from that. Um, now, like I said, that would only reinforce what I do on the web. It wouldn't be. Oh, I'm doing newspapers now. So forget the website. Mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> that's not going to happen. <laughs> oh, don't forget about us. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. It would only enhance that because, if, like I said, if I was doing newspaper mm -hmm. strips daily, well, guess what? Now the web strip, web can go daily. That's how uh -huh. I. Look at it. So then there'd be new stuff every day. So, but uh, you know, um, and also it'd be the it's my main source of communicating with people, which um, I like. I tend it's I've noticed I tend to attract readers who like to be clever, and <laughs> and for the most part they're all pretty polite. So I appreciate that. So, <laughs> um, it's good to know that's the kind of person people that are interested in it. Uh, makes me feel good. And sometimes people come up with gags and jokes and things as they're talking about it that are really funny and it, that brings a, that lightens my day certainly. I enjoy that. Um, so uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else or... Um, I'm not, well, I wish I could think of something too, but... Uh, <laughs> I don't know how much time you have, you know, it's like... <laughs> Oh, I've got plenty of time, but... <laughs> you got plenty of time? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm trying to think if there's uh, any other questions. Um, I've been asked. Uh, uh, let's see. 
does cover a lot of ground. Um, and I don't want to give any too much away when I'm talking about this strip. <laughs> I don't want to spoil it for people who are reading either. But um, but yeah, um, I'll be honest, a character like Beth is not one that I anticipated. She's what? actually a surprise to me. I, I, had, I had known that Lexi needed an antagonist. And mm -hmm. I was going to introduce her as you know, somebody at some point. And... Um, and it was just going to be something to just give Lexi a hard time because it's just like, ugh, just kind of break things up a little bit. But Beth kind of blossomed into a lot more than I expected. You know, some gags just popped into my head that just made sense. And that she has this weird kind of dissonant feel to her that's different than everybody around her. You know, she never looks anybody in the eye quite. You know, she's always just kind of a little bit off. You know, she's... <laughs> you know she, the way she talks is with her mouth wide open. You know? <laughs> She's the only one you can see her whole tongue because she's like shouting whenever she talks. You know, ah. you know she's. Uh, um, but at the same time, you see like little musical notes because when she's up to something, she get, all of a sudden gets kind of musical and she likes to talk. You know, like <laughs> she's in her own like little land. Like, I got. I know something you don't know. I know something. You don't know. <laughs> okay. so, but you can read it all over her. It's not like she's like hiding anything <laughs> necessarily. But uh, at the same time, she is really sneaky because you can't penetrate that shell. And uh, that's one of the things I like about her character. It's completely different than any of the other characters. So it offers a nice contrast. Mm -hmm. you know, so um, one of the things we'll, you know, like I said, there's characters I, I know that I, I go back and I revisit. You know, Thane will be coming back into the picture. He's not... Not gone forever. Not He's just gone. in New York. He will eventually. Curiosity will draw him out. Um, and like I said, I did hint a little bit at Thane's past. I was curious to see how many people recognized him when they saw him, but I don't know if anybody saw him or not. Uh, I think maybe one person might have figured it out, but um, but yeah. So yeah, and I, I like things to be kind of connected. Um, I notice in TV shows a lot lately, everybody's somebody's brother. I don't <laughs> want to do that. You know, my wife says, "Don't make them their brother, and don't name them Jack." <laughs> yeah, no, no soap operas. <laughs> no, 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 no. But everything does have kind of a connection, you know, because when you realize that, like something within a certain sphere, how can they not know about this or not be involved in this aspect or something somewhere along the line, you know? Um, and you might be surprised if you go back and, you know, like I said, you you might see it and not realize that you saw it. Um, and uh, for me, in a way, it's kind of a win because yay, I slipped one past the goalie. You know, at the same time, it's like what? Nobody saw it. <laughs> so it's kind of like a bittersweet. You know? <laughs> Thought somebody would see it. Maybe I didn't focus on it enough, but I wasn't trying to. You know, there's little things I do try to put in there that. If you, when you do see a reveal or something like that later on, you go, oh, wait a minute. If you go way back here and you see it, it's like, yeah, they did know, or they did do that, or yeah, they were involved. You know, um, it's not just this completely, you know, out of nowhere. Um, it, there's always that building. I'm always trying to look ahead and prepare for that in the future. Um, it's not an easy thing to do, and I don't do it perfectly or anything like that, but I try to keep that in, in mind. You know, like you said, it's it's hard to keep that, that train going. But I think of it, you know, my, my driving instructor used to tell me, he said, when you're driving, don't look at the road 10 feet in front of you. Look at the horizon. Because if you look at the road 10 feet in front of you, you're going to be, you know, doing this. Constantly correcting. If you look at the horizon, you can you just drive straight down, and, and you're you're much more focused. You know, you wouldn't think that you are because your peripheral vision picks up all the stuff that's going on here, but because you're focused on that point, you're more able to shoot for that horizon rather than constantly correcting what's ten feet in front of you. And that's the same thing with a story. I feel like if you keep your eye on the horizon, you're less likely to let all this stuff kind of throw you off. Um, and even if it does, you can still correct it more easily by focusing further away than 10 feet in front of you. 
Mm, just. <laughs> I can see the logic behind that, definitely. <laughs> and just look, look, keep looking further ahead. Look for not where you're going to be, as you mentioned, like 10 feet from now, but where you're going to be way further down the road. Right, a mile, even a mile, half a mile down yeah. the road. And if you have that touchstone, if you have that point that you can focus on, it keeps you a lot more steady. And you also have something like you're goal, constantly uh, reaching for, too. Yeah, yeah like, a, like a goal uh, and objective. Yeah. So, you know, but um, yeah. So I mean, of course, in doing that, like I said, I've created all this ancillary story that would be great to tell. But I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I can put it all in the comic strip. You know, it's more. It's designed more for uh, an extended story, which I really I I, I do want to tell at some point. It would be great to do it as a comic book series or. A series of graphic novels, or um, I would even be, go so far as to say I'd love to see it as like a, a television series or something like that at some point in the future. That'd be that'd be really cool. <laughs> like that animated shorts? Not not shorts. I would do like an actual like serial, like you would do for like evening television. Oh. Like, like forty four minutes. I would. I think that would be awesome because I think there's enough story to do that for mm -hmm. at least a few seasons. Um, at least I would say three or four, um, uh, possibly more. I don't know, but I think it's too much to tell because everybody's like, "I'm gonna make a movie one of these days," and I'm like, started thinking about it. It's like, nah, it's too much story for a movie. Then you'd end up clipping stuff out, and you wouldn't, yeah. you know, kind of ruin the ride, you know? Because I've seen people try to jam a big story into a movie, and you're kind of like, "He yeah, is missing something," you know? Trilogies are great, but yeah, sometimes they're getting kind of funky with those nowadays too. So you know, I thought it'd be kind of cool if you could have like a continuing story because I I don't know if I've ever seen that done. I'm sure it's like a mountain of work, which is probably ha why it hasn't been done. <laughs> yeah. But it would be cool because it'd be different. You know, it'd be something you know you could sit down with your kids eight o'clock and watch a TV series that you can all watch together and get something out of it. You know and you don't have to worry, you know. It, I just, th I just think that would be cool. I, I just, and I believe I have enough writing for it, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, in that respect, um, I'm a big fan of uh, what I call quiet movies. Movies that kind of like focus, focus a little bit more on the emotional content. And they're not too rapid fire. Um, I've noticed with some animation, they're so eager to pack as much. Um, humor into it as they can, but they're not taking any time to savor the expression of it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it and it feels like everything's on fast forward. Like, I don't know if you remember like VHS tapes. You know, it's like trying to find a spot in the VHS. You press fast forward, and everybody. <laughs> you know, and some TV shows feel that way to me. Like they're just like rushing through it as fast as they can, mm -hmm. and it's just like. While you don't want to be like slow and bore people to death, there are moments where you want to like take a moment to think about it or, or you know enjoy the laugh, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. not hit them with something right after where they they're missing some of it. Yeah. Timing is everything in animation and writing as well. It's just with animation the timing is set for you. With writing and comic strips the timing is set by the reader. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. But those are some of the thoughts I have about that. So. <laughs> Hopes, you know, it would be kind of cool. I don't have anything that works. but <laughs> I did do wow. one little mini comic um, when I went to my first comic convention. Mm -hmm. um, was it kind of like on the spot thing? The what? Was, it kind of, was that mini comic like on the spots? Or you said um, you went? It was, uh, I actually, um, it was, I was going to Kineticon because mm -hmm. it was the local place to go and I found free parking. Um. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but what I did is I actually went to uh, like Staples and I bought like bulk newsprint, mm -hmm. and um, I basically trimmed it down to size and put it in my laser printer, and I printed out a black and white comic on the newsprint. Mm -hmm. I think it was 24 pages, and. Uh, you know, I had them all laid out so you get two ups on either side, and I ran them through again. Then I went to Staples and I took the covers and I had them laser copy the covers. 
<laughs> and I brought them home, and I stapled them all together, and I trimmed them down, and had like maybe 30 of them. And uh, I went to the comic convention with those. And um, it's a little bit of the story about how the how Ralph is discovered by the Galactic Council. Um, and it's just like one episode, but it's obviously part of the bigger story. I just haven't decided which part it is. I started it as issue one, but it may not be issue one. <laughs> it might be a little different part of the story. But it is part of the story, so it's not changing. It's still what I you know, what you'd say canon. Mm -hmm. But I just might lead up to it and have that issue like as issue twenty three or something like that as opposed to issue number one. But I wanted to try and see how it would look as a comic book. Um, and uh, you know, everything's done like I do in the strip. It's all hand-lettered and drawn in the same style and whatnot, and it's black and white. But I thought it was kind of cool, you know, because it was like a real comic book. You know, you open it up, it's like got the, the slick cover, and you open it up, and it's newsprint on the inside. And I was like, oh, this is cool. It was a little, little bit about that big. I don't know if I have one around. Um, ah, I just had the books. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well. <Wow. laughs> but, um... Yeah, those are those I have to look for. I have like a, a few of them around, but uh, I have to keep them out of the light because the newsprint turns yellow really fast. But that was kind of a cool experience because I got to like actually make it, you know, and make an actual comic book. And uh, that's all I had when I went to my first convention, and uh, I got a pretty good response out of it. You know, I sold most of them that I had, and nobody had ever heard of me before. You know, it's pretty Spartan. You know, I'm just sitting at a naked table. <laughs> <laughs> with a few of these little hand handmade comic books, and I had my portfolio, and I was like, "Hi, doing this? <laughs> Come read my stuff. <laughs> Would you like a bookmark?" <laughs> but uh, but I like being at the conventions and seeing how people respond, and you know what they get out of them, and. Uh, like I said, my hope is that I'm gonna keep honing that and you know expand the audience. It's always the always the battle, you know. Some people choose to expand the audience before they develop the strip, and some people go like me go the other way. And uh, my hope is that it equals out, you know, that even though it takes a little longer. Oops, I'm slipping off the screen. <laughs> <laughs> even though it takes a little longer, um, that it will catch up, you know. In the end, it. It creates something that's a, a lasting value. At least that's what I hope. You know? um, I guess in the end, you know, people who create art, they just kind of want it to be remembered. You know, over the long term. You know, when they created paintings, they created something that they wanted to stand for time. You know, for a long time. It's not just like, yeah, I'll paint this, chuck it out. You know, I mean, you can't imagine like. You know Michelangelo or you know, these guys. You know, like spending hours like making you know paint from like egg yolks and like <laughs> finding like minerals of the earth and like p mixing them together to create this color. You know, crushing up an orchid or something like that. You know, and then like, yeah, that looks really good. <laughs> no, they did that because they were hoping it would stand for some. You know, that they do something that affected people that people would think about it for a while and. You know, and I guess that's kind of way I think about this. I want something that's funny that you enjoy in the moment, but maybe you can go back through and you can kind of go, you know, there was a little bit more here, and mm -hmm. it was a fun ride. You know, what was he saying here? Maybe, maybe there's something a little under the surface that he was saying. You know, was he saying something about himself? Was he saying something about society? What, mm -hmm. what was going on there? You know, and I don't like to, you know, turn my hand on that. I'm a pretty open book, but I don't want to interpret everything for the reader because that's part of the fun of being the reader is interpreting it for yourself you know and you may get something completely different than what I intended and that's part of what makes it art I think is you mix a little bit of what you see and what you know with what you expect or perceive and that changes into something unique in of itself you know the same can be said for literature as well as visual art you know, um, just because you put words on a page doesn't mean People are going to interpret it the same way that you write it down. Right. <laughs> you know, you can make it as clear as possible, and that's what lawyers get paid for, right? You know, to try and make it unchangeable. We know exactly what these words mean, and still, yet some other lawyer finds a way to <laughs> to change wow. the meaning of those words. 
<laughs> but uh, that's the aspect I, I think is kind of cool about art in general. And I apply that in a broad palette. I don't mean just like drawing as art or painting. I mean, whatever you do that you do to express yourself that you try to do with excellence, that's art. You know, it, to me, anyways. Yeah. That's how I feel about it. <laughs> what my opinion's worth. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so. Um, <laughs> Well, yeah, then, and uh, I wish you the best in the, your endeavors. I hope to see you in the newspapers. I hope and, so, too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That'd be really cool. <laughs> but, um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's one, of the, one of the big projects I'm working on. I, I have done other projects, um, I mean, for people who would like to know. Um, you know, I've worked on uh, a couple other graphic novel projects. I did, like, uh, Treasure Island for a place called Graphic oh. Classics. Um, I did one for, uh, uh, they were doing a leveled reading for school children called Ghost House. Mm -hmm. um, I've done uh, some children's books for individuals and whatnot, and uh, I'm still working on a, a, an RPG game for uh, a man named Lee Garvin. It's called uh, Tales of the Floating Vagabond, and uh, it's going to be the second edition. It's just, uh, he met with a some serious health issues, so that kind of got prolonged, and now I'm busy and I'm trying to work it out <laughs> so I can get, I get back to it. You know, these these things happen, but you know, um, that's that's one of the other things that I that'll be coming out hopefully in the not too distant future, and um, you know, into some other various uh, freelance things. But I'm hoping to tie up the ones that I have so that I can work just on Ralph the Destroyer in the not too distant future, because like I said, I'd like to get the uh, the uh, refresh rate up quicker, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I'm like I said, I'm hoping if things go well and get in the newspapers, I'm going to need that free time to focus on that more and uh, get more material out. And uh, I mean, I'm actually right now working on the uh, the promotional package that you send to newspapers to make sure that's the best that it can be. Um, Sounds good. Well, best of luck, and thank well, you very thank much you for much. speaking with me today and joining uh, joining me on Two Weeks Talking. <laughs> no problem. I always en I always enjoy talking about the subject, um, whether it's my work or somebody else's. If you know, if it's good work, it's good work, and I, I like to see what other people are doing too. Um, you know, uh, we all influence each other to some degree. That's um, part of being the social creatures that we are. We never know what's going to be created when we cross paths. Yeah. And I wish you luck on your uh, your endeavors there. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> and hopefully this will be a, a, a nice start, kind of uh, working with uh, with Kurt on his uh, big projects. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to it. That's, that's cool. Thank that's you. Cool. You learn more by doing than anything else. Let's be honest. <laughs> that's that's very true. <laughs> All the planning in the world doesn't doesn't uh, help you out when it comes time to actually put the rubber to the road. So. Mm -hmm. but, Sure. I'm, I hope it uh, hope it turns out very well for you. Anyways. Thank you very much. And thank you for asking me. Yeah, I was I was happy to be tell Kurt. I was I'm thankful for uh, for him asking me as well. Uh, let yeah, him be I, part of it again. I appreciate I will, it. Yeah, I will forward that message. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Then so. that was uh, Scott Lincoln from Ralph the Destroyer. Check out his website, RalphTheDestroyer.com. It's uh, amazing. Over 300 or maybe even four, over 400 strips. So there's a lot to catch up on, a lot of content to read. Thank you, and once again, thank you, Scott, for joining us today. Thank you. Great. Have a good day. You Bye. have a good day, too. Take care. Take care.